any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me and the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit which they, they that believe in him, on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Lord, we thank you today, God. We thank you for being all powerful, for being all knowing, God. We thank you for this time of prayer, oh God. You said in your word, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek your face, Lord God. And we thank you, God, for this time of prayer, oh Lord God. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you cleanse and sanctify us in the name of Jesus, Lord. We know that we will often fall short of your word, oh God. We will often fall short of your glory, oh God, Lord. But you, we ask that you help us to recognize those things, Lord God, those things that are in our heart that are not pure, oh God. Lord, help us, give us the recognition, oh God, that we may see what we need in our lives, oh God. Oh Lord, we thank you for the power of your Holy Ghost, oh God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you sanctify us, Lord. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness oh God. Lord, search our hearts, oh God. If you find anything that's not like you, Lord, we ask that you cut it out, God. Do surgery on us, oh God. Find anything, Lord God, that's malignant in our bodies, oh God, and take it out, oh God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Scrub our hearts, oh God. Find any dirtiness or any uncleanliness in our lives, oh God, and cleanse us, Lord, from the crown of our heads to the sole of our feet, oh God. Cleanse us, Lord. Make us clean sanctify us, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. Lord, you are the great physician, Lord God. Search our hearts, oh God. Search our spirits and our minds, oh God. And anything that's not like you, Lord God, take it away, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We want to be clean, God. We want to be holy, God. We want to be righteous, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. Create in us a clean heart, oh God. Hallelujah. And renew a right spirit within us, oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We cast out anything in our lives that has not been planted by you in the name of Jesus, oh God. Thoughts that are planted by the enemy, oh God. We cast them out in the name of Jesus, oh God. Oh Lord, change me, oh God. Lord, make me more like you, oh God. Lord, I just want to be like you, oh God. I want to have your spirit, oh God. Hallelujah, Lord God. Cleanse our minds, oh God, from evil thoughts, oh God. Cleanse our tongues, oh God, from evil words that we speak, oh God, go before us, oh God, before we speak, oh God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, hallelujah, Lord, we ask God that you cleanse and heal every wounded place in our lives and in our hearts, oh God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, oh God, heal us, Lord, where we are broken, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God, mend us where we are broken and have fallen apart, oh God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you are the potter, Lord, we are the clay, Lord, God. Break us, Lord, so you can make us anew, oh God. Break down, Lord God, things that we need broken down in our lives, oh God, so that you can make us new, oh God. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, oh God. Purge us with his up, oh God. Wash us and we shall be clean, oh God. Hallelujah, sanctify us, oh God. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Cover us with your precious blood, oh God. Sanctify us with your powerful, precious blood, in the name of Jesus, oh God, append every place that has been rigid, oh God, straighten every place that has been crooked, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God, deliver us from ourselves, oh God, deliver us from our own thoughts, oh God, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, oh God, we claim victory, God, over every demonic device in our lives, oh God, we claim victory, oh God, over the things that the devil tries to tell us, oh God, we claim victory, oh God, over depression, Oh God, in the name of Jesus, we claim victory, oh God, over oppression, oh God. Lord, let it be counted all as joy, oh God. We claim victory, God, over anxiety, oh God, in the name of Jesus. We claim victory, oh God, over everything that tries, all the battles that go on in our mind, oh God. We claim victory, oh God, over everything 
that the devil tries to confuse us, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God, hallelujah, hallelujah, God, we lay aside every distraction, God, that has kept us from you, oh God, whether it be our families, oh God, whether it be television, oh God, whether it be our children, oh God, whether it be our jobs, oh God, anything that has distracted us from being in your word, oh God, and drawing closer to you in the name of Jesus, oh God, Lord, we we find every distraction that tries to cloud our mind in the name of Jesus. Oh God, hallelujah. Any confusion that tries to cloud our minds, oh God, take it away in the name of Jesus. Oh God, you said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Oh God, deliver our minds, oh God. Hallelujah. Lord, we find mental illness in the name of Jesus. The mental illness that tries to plague our children, oh God, that tries to like our families, oh God, our husbands, oh God, Lord, we bind it in the name of Jesus. Satan, you have no authority over our mind. Hallelujah. The name of Jesus. Oh God, Lord, keep our minds. Oh God, keep our minds. Oh God, let our thoughts be filled with heavenly thoughts. Oh God, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, you said you would keep us in perfect peace, Lord God. If we keep our minds stayed on you, God, cover our minds. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, oh God, we lay aside every strife, oh God, we lay aside envy, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God, we lay aside rebellious spirits, oh God, in the name of Jesus, let our hearts be free, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, oh God, hallelujah, Lord God, Lord, give us control over our flesh, hey, glory, in the name of Jesus, oh God, every fleshly manifestation oh god we bind it in the name of jesus oh god teach us to control our bodies and our flesh oh god let our flesh die daily oh god in the name of jesus lord god let us kill our flesh every day oh god you said no good thing dwelleth in this flesh oh god and we take control over it let it come under your command oh god in the name of jesus hallelujah lord help us to meditate on your word help us to hide your word in our hearts that we may not sin against you oh god give us a spirit of yearning and for your word and a thirst for your word and for your righteousness oh god let our light shine oh god let us be a beacon of light in this dark and evil world oh god let our light shine so that men may see our good works and give you glory oh god in the name of jesus oh god oh let our life reflect you oh god and let us live a life that's worthy of our calling oh god let us walk in our anointing that you have called us to walk in oh god let us do the things that you have called us to do oh god in the name of jesus hallelujah lord god let us forever be connected to you oh god give us a spiritual connection oh god that will never be broken by the wiles of the enemy oh god in the name of jesus hallelujah lord let us hear you god let us know your gentle voice oh god let us hearken into your word oh god in the name of jesus hallelujah 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 lord open our eyes god that we may see your wondrous works god open our ears oh god that you could so that we may hear what you are saying unto us in these days oh god in the name of jesus oh god lord open our understanding oh god open our understanding to the scripture oh god give us revelation oh god give us revelation in the scripture oh god give us spiritual songs in our hearts oh god in the name of jesus oh god oh lord let heavenly thoughts fill our mind oh god in the name of jesus lord Give us a thirst for righteousness, oh God. Give us a hunger for you and the things of you, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. Hallelujah, oh God. Lord, let us be ready to work in the kingdom, oh God. Hey, let us be ready to work without the expectation of recognition, oh God. Let us be ready to work, oh God, no matter what our title is, oh God. Let us be ready to move forward, oh God, without looking back in the past, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. Hallelujah, oh God. Let us move the kingdom forward, oh God. Let us move the kingdom forward for your glory, for your glory, oh God, for your glory, for your glory, for your glory, oh God. God. Hallelujah. Ignite the Holy Ghost fire in us, oh God. Stir up the gifts, oh God, in us, oh God. Give us Holy Ghost boldness, oh 
God. No more church as usual, business as usual, oh God. Give us a deeper depth and, and higher heights in you, oh God. Take us further than we've ever gone, oh God. Give us spiritual maturity, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. And make us giant slayers, oh God. <laughs> hey, glory. <laughs> Lord God, we know that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, oh God, but we're wrestling in the spiritual realm, oh God. Hallelujah. Let us put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to withstand in these evil days, oh God. Strengthen us spiritually, oh God. Give us mighty strength, oh God. Make us spiritual gangsters, oh God. Make us spiritual, spiritual Make us equipped for spiritual warfare, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord God. Let us tap into our anointing, oh God. Let us walk into our anointing, oh God. Hallelujah, let your anointing flow through us like the oil that flowed from Aaron's beard, oh God. Oh Lord, we thank you, God. We glorify you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Deacon Brown. It's star six. Amen. Okay, prayer focus two. We are praying that God will give us the tenacity to stand on the promise of his word and believe that he will fill those who are seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We take authority over the spirit of doubt, the spirit of unbelief, and the spirit of fear. We are also praying that he will increase our faith, that we may help those who are seeking to the baptism of the Holy Ghost in its fullness, according to Acts 2 and 4. Amen. Acts 2 and 4 reads, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. Father God, once again, we come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts, praying that you forgive us of our sins, Father. Forgive us for the things we have done that's not pleasing in thy sight, and wash and purge us in the blood of the Lamb, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest, rule, and abide in us, that yokes would be destroyed, our minds be renewed. In Jesus' name we pray. This, this evening. Father, we pray that you go in the convalescent homes, jail houses, prison system, touch, heal, and deliver, and set free. Lord, in the minds of your people, renew right now. And we give your glory, and we give your praise, Father. We just want to bless you, Father, tonight. We just want to bless you because you're a good God. You're a wonderful Savior. There's nothing like you, Father. Oh, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you have your way. Have your way, Lord, down in our souls. Have your way in our minds, Father. Lord, renew our minds that we would think right. Lord, renew our attitudes, Father, that we will be as the children of God. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord, and we give you all the glory and honor because you are a wonderful Savior. You are the God of restoration, the God of second chances. There's nothing like you in all the earth. We praise you tonight. Hallelujah to the King. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come on in, Lord, and sup with us. Lord, go into the go, go into the homes of each and every one under the sound of my voice, Father. And Lord, touch them, Father. You know what they're in need of. You know what their families are going, taking them through, or what they're going through with their children. We don't know. But, Father, we lift each and every family up before you. And, Lord, we pray for release. Lord, we pray for breakthroughs. Lord, we pray for 
spark uh, for the revival of our souls. Uh, in Jesus' name, we need your strength. Uh, we know the enemy is walking to and from, uh, seeking who he may devour. Uh, but Lord, we are under your, under the oil, under your protections, uh, and we must keep the faith. Uh, we must stay focused uh, and believe, uh, Lord, that you are working it out, uh, even when it don't look like it, uh, even when it feels like it's all falling apart around us. Uh, but Lord, uh, in the spiritual realm, uh, oh, we can see uh, the manifestation of holiness. Uh, we can see it all coming together. Uh, and we are just waiting, Lord. Uh, we are waiting, Father, uh, because our hope lies in you. Uh, you are the God. Uh, you are the resurrection. Uh, you are the newness of life. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you for your blessings. Uh, thank you for your healings. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for deliverance, Father. And we pray right now, Father, for each and every one, Lord, that is seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you will renew the minds, renew the thought patterns. Lord, that they will begin to see themselves being filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, being filled, Lord. Uh, Lord, not questioning it, but Lord, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, that because we are God chasers, uh, because we are God chasers, uh, and we love you, Lord, uh, your word is true. Uh, your word is powerful. Uh, your word is as a two-edged sword. Uh, and what your word says, uh, it shall come to pass. Uh, and those that believe uh, on his name, uh, those that believe uh, shall be filled. Those that be leave uh, without a shadow of a doubt uh, shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, your word let us know. Uh, we just got to hold on uh, and have the desire, uh, have the passion, uh, Lord, to have the relationship with you. Uh, Lord, to, to meditate on you 24-7. Uh, Lord, to chase you, Lord. Uh, and Lord, not only to chase you, but to catch you, Lord. Uh, because, Lord, in the spiritual realm, uh, we we can see ourselves uh, coming out, uh, coming out and having a breakthrough, uh, coming out and being delivered, uh, coming out and being set free uh, in Jesus' name, uh, because that is your will for us. Uh, that is your divine power uh, that is working down on the inside. Uh, and we thank you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the Holy Ghost. Uh, we thank you for the filling. Uh, we thank you for the anointing uh, that destroys the yokes. Uh, oh, no weapon. Uh, and I say no no weapon formed against us shall prosper, because we are in your hands. Lord, you are the potter. We are the clay. You are molding and shaping us. And all, all things that comes against us come to make us stronger. All our trials and tribulations, they come to mold and shape us. And Lord, you know what's best for your children. Lord, we are your sheep, Lord. And we must act as such. So we are praying right now, Lord, that you give us clarity. Oh, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Give us clarity and understanding. Lord, of how Lord, you would have us to be. What our calling is. What is your will for our lives? But Lord, we know this, that we must love without no expectation or nothing in return, which is called agape love. Lord, that we will love those that despitefully use us. Hallelujah. We will love those that talk about us. Hallelujah. We will love those, Father, that's backbiting. Lord, in Jesus' name, because love covers a mother to the folks. Oh, Lord, there's deliverance and love. Oh, there's breakthroughs and revivals in love. Oh, there's the manifestation of holiness in love. There's nothing like it. Oh, Lord, your word let us know of all the things that's in the word. Love is the greatest. Love is what draws us to you. Love is what separates us from the world. Because the, the world loves those that love them. But we must love those that don't love us. Lord, help us to be better. Help us, Lord. We must love those that talk about us. Oh, Lord, in some ways we find it difficult. But if we focus, Lord, you let us know if we hold on, deliverance comes. If we believe, Lord, deliverance comes. Breakthroughs come. Oh, Lord, we see things with spiritual eyes in Jesus' name. There's nothing that we cannot see if we have the love of God. The Spirit of God will speak in us and through us. It would help us to understand. Lord, help us to be more spiritual.
spiritual mind. Father, we pray this prayer that the flesh decrease. Oh, bless us, Lord. Mm -hmm. Then the spiritual man increase. That we will come out. Lord, we are like in the oven, but we will come out like pure gold. Lord, mm -hmm. doing the works that you have called us to do. Lord, being a help. Lord, in the household of faith. Lord, giving our pastor support. Lord, not questioning those things that he has. You had given him to do. But Lord, we are lined up. So all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. Bless his holy name. Wonderful Savior, how great thou art. We love you and we praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. Because you are our hope, our deliverer. You are the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Oh, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Job 2, 23 to 29 reads, Be glad ye, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the farmer rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, mm. the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord your God, that he has wonders, he has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your young, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens, in those days I will pour out my spirit. And my focus tonight is we say yes to the Lord. We submit ourselves to his lordship. We surrender completely to his will. We are praying that he will pour out his spirit upon his people like never before. We are praying that he will pour out on everyone, every age, from the senior to the children. And we believe that this outpouring will bring a life-changing revival to our community. Father God, I just thank you. I praise you. I magnify your name. I thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace. I thank you for your love. I thank you for all you've done and what you're going to you do. You are a good, good father. Lord, we worship your name because you alone are worthy. You deserve all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. Lord, I'm asking you to wash us and cleanse us and purge us and renew us, revive us. Lord, give us a mindset that you have to do the things that you would have us to do. Oh, God, anything that separates us from you, we're asking you to take it out and cleanse us. Lord, we're seeking for your Holy Ghost. Uh, oh, God, those that have never received and those that have received, we need a refilling. Uh, oh, God, renewing, a reviving. Oh, God, so that we can take on the work, uh, so that we can do the kingdom work, so that we can tell others of your love, of your joy, of your peace. Oh, God, fill us with the Holy Ghost like never before, because we know time is short and you're coming quickly, and we must abide in this great commission to go out into the world and bid others to come and tell them that you save, you deliver, and set free. Oh, God, prepare your people to be the people you would have us to be, to do the things you would have us to do, to speak your word in season and out of season. Oh, God, you told us in your word to ask that it shall be given, to seek it, we shall find, to knock and door shall be open. Lord, we're seeking a refilling. Uh, everything that is hindering us, uh, anything that's stopping us, uh, Lord, we're saying yes. 
Yes to your will for you to cleanse us. Yes to your will for you to take everything out, every hindrance. Oh God, every thought in our mind that's not like you. Oh God, if we have someone that we have not forgiven, God forgive us. Oh God, if we cause anyone to go straight, Lord forgive us. Because we want to be about your business. Doing your will, serving you. So we say yes, Lord. We say yes, Lord. Whatever it takes, whatever you would have us to do, whatever you would have us to say, whatever you would have us to go, wherever, Lord. And we say yes to your will. We want to be about your business. And we need that power from on high. We can't do it without you, Lord. And we will say and give you credit for it. Lord, pour out your spirit upon all of us. Oh, God, that we may speak with new tongues. Oh, God, not just with the utterance, Lord, but our lives will be changed. Our mind will be changed. Our behavior will be changed. Our attitude will be changed. And people will say, what must I do to be saved from seeing our life? Oh, God, from watching our habits and what we do. Oh, God, and I thank you. Oh, God, let Mount Sinai be the first partaker. Oh, God, of doing your perfect will. Let our light shine before men. Oh, God, help us to be the salt of the earth. Oh, God, so that when souls come in, oh, God, we'll be ready to receive. Oh, God, we will be your disciples, doing your will, teaching your word, living for you. In spirit and in truth. Uh, oh God, wash our hearts. Uh, give us a pure heart. Uh, purge us with kiss up that we may be clean. Uh, wash us that we may be whiter than snow. Uh, oh God, help us to be a light to this world, uh, to our nation. Uh, oh God, our leaders. Uh, oh God, help us to be that light. Uh, that turn to and fro. Uh, that talk with every wind. Uh, oh God, but loving you and living for you on and we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And we thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you for the move that shall take place. We thank you for the revival that is coming, that has started already. And we praise your holy name because you are a good, good father. Oh, God, and we thank you. You told us to taste and see that you are good. And you told us, blessed is the man that trusts in you. Oh, God, help us to trust in you unconditionally. Help us to have that great faith to know that you can do anything but fail, that you can move mountains, that you can open doors, you can set the captives free. Oh, God, every stronghold must be broken. Every high place must come down. Oh, God, and we thank you for the power to speak things into existence. We thank you for the power, oh, God, to send the word to the hospitals. We thank you for the power, oh, God, to change our nation. Oh, God, to be God lovers, to be God chasers. And we praise your holy name. And we magnify your holy name. And we're asking you to fill us again. We're asking you to renew us again. We're asking you to revive us again. Oh, God, as we yield to you, as we seek your faith, as we set apart a time of prayer, as we fast before you, not just when it's called by pastor, but have our own fast times. Oh, God, coming to know you. Oh, God, in an intimate setting, as Lord and Savior that can do anything but fail. And we praise your holy name. And we magnify your holy name because you will and you can do it. With yielded hearts, we come before you. Oh, God, crying and speaking your faith with an open spirit for you to fill us. Oh, God, fill our vessels as we say yes. Fill our hearts as we say yes. Fill our minds with your word. Help us to meditate on your word day and night. Help us to have a praise in our hearts instead of what's going on in spite of what's going on. But to have 
going to continue praise. Uh, despite whatever circumstances are going on, you are in control. Uh, help us to trust you unconditionally. Help us to believe in you unconditionally. Help us to know that you can do anything but fail. And we praise your holy name. Uh, and we magnify your holy name. And we lift you up because you are good. Uh, you are our Father. You are Alpha and Omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are our doctor in the sick room. You are lawyer in the courtroom. You are here for us and we thank you. We just have to trust and believe. We need great faith. Increase our faith, Lord, to know that you can do anything but fail. Fill our babies. Fill our children. Oh, God, so that they can have power to walk under the anointing. Fill our young adults. Fill our youth to walk under the anointing. Fill our uh, seniors and, oh, God, the elders again and the missionaries again. Oh, God, the mother's board again, the usher board, the deacons and the deacon's wives. Uh, fill us again, Lord. Uh, oh, God, we say yes and we're ready. Uh, we're ready to do your will. Uh, we're ready to work the work uh, a kingdom work. Uh, oh, God, everywhere we go, we're going to let our light shine. Uh, Oh, God, wherever there is in the grocery store, on our jobs, in our homes, we're going to let our light shine. Oh, God, and we thank you. 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 For every good and perfect that comes from you. And we praise your name in everything. We worship you for everything. And we magnify your name. And we lift you up. Help us to follow your lead. Uh, help us to trust in your lead uh, and not our own understanding uh, in all our ways acknowledging you uh, as you direct our path. Uh, and we give you the praise, we give you the honor, we give you the glory for you are good. Uh, you are good. Uh, you are good. Uh, and we say yes. Uh, we say yes, 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 yes to your will. We say yes, Lord, whatever it takes. We say yes, uh, and we give you the praise, honor, and the glory uh, in Jesus' name. Uh, thank you, Lord. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Are we live? Thank the Lord. Well, welcome to the Mount Sinai Church of God in Christ, Pastoral Bible Study. This is Pastor Roan, your host for this evening. Certainly grateful, honored, and glad that you are with us on today. We're so glad that you decided to study with us. You could have gone anywhere else, but you decided to come with us today, and we praise God for you. Praise God for uh, the saints of the Mount Sinai Church and that wonderful time of prayer. Uh, God certainly met us on this evening. And we continue to pray, seeking the face of the Lord in this special week of consecration and prayer, preparing for a night of Pentecost on this Sunday night, uh, the 13th of June at 6 p.m. live at the Mount Sinai Church of God of Christ. All are welcome to attend. Don't worry about registering. Just show up because God is going to do something very special. Pastor Anthony Begay will be our special guest along with this church. And uh, we're going to have a Holy Ghost time. If you need deliverance, you need to be there. If you're looking for a breakthrough, you need to be there. If you're looking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you need to be there. We've been praying all week, this week, in preparation for that night that God would do something special. When you're looking for revival, when you're looking for God to do something special and unusual, you need to do something unusual. So we are laying before the Lord and coming together as a church body to cry out to God, asking him to meet us there on Sunday night. And we believe 
that God is going to do great things. Thank God for all of you that are on the line on tonight. We are studying uh, the uh, gifts of the Spirit. Tonight, we want to talk about the fivefold ministries, and we want to go to the book of Ephesians. Um, if I can get my screen to come up here. Sorry, brother. All right. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 4, 11. Lord, bless your word. For it is the answer to your word that giveth light. Open our eyes that we may see, and our ears that we may hear. And touch our hearts, O God, that we may understand what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's read some scripture. Ephesians 4 and 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Um, further up in this verse, uh, we read uh, some thoughts of Paul about Jesus uh, talking about the fact that he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. He said he ascended, but first he descended into the depths of the earth, meaning that Jesus, after his uh, crucifixion, uh, preached to the spirits in prison for three days. And after that, he rose from the dead. Jesus was the first one to break out of the jaws of hell. He broke down the gates of hell. And the Bible says he led captivity, those who were kept in the place called Abraham's bosom, captive. He led from them from their captivity into the gates of splendor, into heaven itself. Therefore, now that he has established himself as the intercessor and the mediator of a new covenant, uh, all who die now do not go to Abraham's bosom, but they go into the presence of the Lord himself. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And um, so that's what Paul is talking about, that uh, he led captivity captive. And then he says he gave gifts unto men. So after he relocated the place of rest for the saints, he began to give gifts to the church. He gave the and the first gift that Jesus gave to the church was the gift of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Jesus talked about that gift. He told us to expect that gift. He told us to look forward to that gift. He told them on the last day of the feast, and we've been reading that scripture for the last several weeks. He said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth in me, other scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus was talking again about the Holy Ghost. In verse 38 of chapter 7 of John, he says, But this he spake of the Holy Ghost, because the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus prepared his disciples uh, for this baptism. He prepared them to receive this great gift of the baptism of the Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, the gift arrived, for they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And the rest literally is history. For that was the day that the church, as we know it today, was born. The church was born on the day of Pentecost. And then the Bible says he gave gifts unto men. So after that first gift that he gave us, which is the gift of the Holy Ghost, he gave us gifts or manifestations of power of the Spirit in our lives. In other words, he gave giftings unto his people. And every believer has a gift. Every believer has been endued with a special gift from the Lord. That is scriptural. That is biblical. So when we read about the gifts of the Spirit, we all need to understand that that includes all of us. All of us have been gifted. Every person in the body of Christ has a gift because every person in the body of Christ has a purpose. Your purpose dictates your gift. Whatever God has called you to do, he has gifted you to do that. And whether it's singing, preaching, praying, serving, loving, encouraging, what have you, whatever your gift is. And we're going to be talking about this, that this week and next week. God has empowered you with a special gift to work in the body of Christ, to do great things for the kingdom of God and to bless the people of God. Uh, I was talking to a pastor friend this week. And uh, he has actually developed a, uh, a a level one of discipleship, 52 lessons, one week, one lesson for every week of the year. And one of his lessons is you are not called to sit in the church and do nothing. And I said, amen to that. 
He teaches his people that when you get saved, God has a, an assignment for you. And if you're a pew member uh, with no assignment, that's not God's fault. That's your need to hear the Lord and understand what he's called you to do. Uh, a lot of people are intimidated because they look at people who are in the spotlight and people who seem to be so gifted and multi-talented and so heavily anointed. And they say, I can never be like that. I can never do that. I can never sing like that, preach like that, talk like that. But you know what? Don't compare yourself to people that are in the spotlight because the gifting that God has given you may not be a gift that works in the spotlight. It may be something very, um, uh, undercover. It may be something that is in the background. It may be something behind the scenes, but nevertheless, your gifting is important and your gifting is just as relevant and useful and needful to the body of Christ as the person who's in the spotlight. Praise the name of our God. So when the Bible says that Jesus gave gifts unto men, that means he gave us giftings or empowerments to fulfill the purpose that he has given us in the body of Christ. That brings us to verse 11. He gave some, not all, but some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers. And many have called this the five-fold ministries. Now, there are a lot of gifts. I can, I'm not even be able to get to the gifts, the, the rest of them tonight. We talked about those nine power gifts, prophecy, healing, um, uh, miracles, and whatnot. Uh, but now we're talking about a different group of gifts, the fivefold ministries. And Paul tells us they're for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He makes a delineation between these gifts and those other gifts he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, or chapter 12, rather. Um, these gifts have a special, special purpose. Let's talk about these gifts on tonight. Let's see what they are. The first gift, he says, is apostles. What are the apostles? The apostles were those 12 disciples. The disciples became the apostles. The apostles um, were the pillars of the church. The Bible says the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the head of the corner or the main supportive structure. The, they were, the, the apostolic gift is the foundational gift. It is the gift of the foundation of the church. The apostles are the ones that built the church and the ones who laid the foundations to build up on. The church as we know it today was built on the foundation of the ministry of the apostles that followed Jesus for three and a half years. And even after they uh, came on the scene, there was another wave of apostles that came, Paul being among them, who did not um, follow Jesus personally and in person. But afterwards, after the church was established, he was one of those uh, that were led to Christ and became an apostle. Uh, apostles affirm the doctrine of the church. Uh, apostles are the ones that uh, delineate, declare, uh, the, the the doctrine of the church and the church needs doctrine. The doctrine of the basic tenets of faith, what we believe. The apostles have been authorized as the fathers of the church, as the person who sat at the feet of Jesus, the persons who received revelation from Jesus himself. They imparted unto us as doctrine. The apostles also walked in the power of the Holy Ghost. The um, the ones who read about in the book of Acts uh, had the gift of miracles and worked. Uh, in the power of the Spirit in their lives. I believe it's uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and 12. Paul says, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and in mighty deeds. In other words, you saw God work in my life. I proved to you that I'm an apostle. One of the things about the apostle Paul is he often found himself defending his apostleship because he was not one of the original 12. Many doubted his apostleship apostolic authority. And so Paul found himself on the defensive many times, proving to people that he was an apostle. And it's useful to us to look at the apostle Paul because Paul gives us more detail and makes the criteria of a, an apostle more granular as we read about his life. 
He affirmed doctrine. Well, Paul affirmed doctrine. As a matter of fact, it was Paul that wrote almost half of the New Testament. So he was certainly one of the ones that affirmed the doctrine. And he affirmed the doctrine as he heard it from the, the original generation of the apostles. What else do uh, they do? Uh, they uh, work in the gifts. We talked about that. Um, Another characteristic was that they were pastoral at heart, but they were also evangelistic. They planted churches. They established ministries. They disciple converts. They ordained pastors in those churches. And, uh, and when they raised up uh, pastors and disciple converts, and they saw the men of ability raised up and were ready to lead, they left them in charge, appointed them pastors, and moved on to the next assignment. Paul was one of those persons. He was a prime example. He established churches in Ephesus and Galatia and in Corinth and in Thessalonica and in Laodicea and in Philippi and Colossae and the list goes on and on. The question would then be asked, have there been any apostles since the days of the New Testament church? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, uh, and I would say that God has sent ap apostolic figures to us throughout the centuries. People who actually who heard from God and, and started a, a movement that brought the people back to God and reconnected people with the doctrine of God. You could say that Martin Luther was an apostolic figure in a way because he was the father of the Reformation. He was the one who had the guts to stand up and tell the uh, leaders of the Catholic Church that we do not follow the um, the dictates of the Pope. We follow the word of God. Uh, solo scriptura was his term that he used, means only scripture. And he said, the just shall live by faith. We could think of another figure. I can think of John Wesley. John Wesley was the one that literally in, reintroduced the doctrine of sanctification to the modern world. And he was the one that actually began to talk about sanctification in that he had an experience that later was described by some as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So he he was an apostolic figure because revival broke out through his ministry and the power of God followed him. And you should read about his story, read about his life, read about Aldersgate. What an incredible story of a man who was in his own rights an apostle. Who else do we read about? I think about C.H. Mason. Um, with the founder of the Church of God in Christ. Oh, he was an apostle for sure because he actually started the movement called the Church of God in Christ. And uh, his church, the church that he founded, was the vehicle that God used to literally shape this modern world. Did you not know that through the Church of God in Christ, the Assemblies of God was born and the Four Square Church was born? There's another apostolic figure, Amy Simple McPherson. She was the founder of that church. What a wonderful woman of God. What a powerful woman of God. And today, Assemblies of God and the Church of God in Christ and the Four Square are around the world shaking the globe for God because of the life and history of this man, C.H. Mason. I would call him an apostolic figure. What else do we see about apostolic figures? Apostolic figures work in the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom is the ability to pull out uh, nuggets of uh, scriptural truth, of divine Christ truth into uh, the minds of men and to impart it as revelation knowledge. Um, I would think that there are many who have been able to do this over the years. Uh, so the, there are many that I would call apostolic figures. Not many, well, not a whole lot, but there are many. And um, I have to say that we're, we have to be careful about that title. Be careful about the title of apostle because a lot of people are bearing this title incorrectly. They have labeled themselves and declared themselves to be apostles. And one thing about the apostles, the apostles were always under the authority of the church, even though they were themselves apostles and leaders and trendsetters and founders of ministries, they themselves brought themselves under the authority of the church. When you have a person who calls himself an apostle who will refuses to be under the authority of the church, look out, run from that guy, because that guy is dangerous. He puts himself in a very dangerous position because when he has no covering, when he has no leader, when he has no apostolic authority in his own life, he is subject to error. And when he falls into error, he causes all the people that are following him to fall into error with him. So those are the apostles. Let's look at other things, other people. What, what else can we think about um, uh, in the, these ministries? What other ministries can we talk about? We're going to talk about 
prophecy for a minute. I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. He says, but one who prophesies, New Living Translation, strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. Let's talk about prophecy for just a minute. The scripture places a high value on the gift of prophecy. It's listed among the power gifts of the Corinth in Corinthians chapter 12. It's listed among the helping gifts in Romans chapter 12. And it's also mentioned here in our text on today. We see, we keep running into prophecy for some reason because prophecy is very much needed in the church. Uh, there's a reason we keep running into this gift uh, in the scriptures because it is so vital to the church. We need prophecy in the church. And that's why it's part of the fivefold ministry. Prophets are God's gift to the church. Now, I want to say this. You got to be careful because everybody that calls himself a prophet is not a prophet. Everybody that says they have a prophetic ministry does not have a prophetic ministry. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But Paul clearly delineates the purpose of prophecy. He said, those who prophesy strengthen, they encourage, and they comfort people. Um, and let's keep that in mind. But uh, then we see in the Old Testament that in the, and in the New Testament, there's been anointing of prophecy empowers the prophet to predict the future as well. And that is certainly a substantive and legitimate uh, working of prophecy. But the primary role of those three things that Paul mentions, the uh, strengthening, which is edification, encouraging, and comforting. Um, the word of prophecy comes to strengthen. Uh, the King James uses uh, the word edification. What does it mean? It means to build up. Um, and we need to be built up, especially when everything in your eyesight, every time everything in your line of sight in the time of crisis tells you and declares to you that you're not going to make it, that you have a crisis where you uh, look at, you're looking at defeat in the face and you're, you're, it looks like you're not going to survive. It looks like you're not going to make it. You need a prophetic word in that time. You need somebody to speak into your life. Your faith needs strengthening in that moment. Uh, I know, of course, Romans 10, 17 says that just, um, uh, that um, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, the, we do get built up by hearing the word of God and hearing and hearing it over and over again. It builds our faith. And the more we confess the word and speak the word of our life, the stronger our faith gets. We need to pray because staying in the presence of God builds up our faith and raises our expectation. But sometimes you get in a situation where your faith needs a little jump start. You need someone to just speak into your life. You need somebody to speak into your spirit just at that right time. You need a confirmation that you're moving in the right direction. You need a confirmation that you got, you're looking at them believing for the right outcome, that you're walking in the right way, that you got the right attitude, that you got the right perspective. And when these things are confirmed through the word of prophecy, you're good for the duration. When a word comes to you at the right time, it'll strengthen your faith. And again, in these cases, the prophetic word is not revelation, it's confirmation. It's God confirming what you already heard him say to you in the first place. I can think of my own life. And you've heard me tell this story before when I had to come home after running out of money at school and I had to leave a school and come back home to Pomona and start going to Mount Sac and getting a job at the local grocery store after I'd spent time flipping burgers at, at uh, Wendy's. And, and uh, I felt humiliated. I felt embarrassed. And I wondered what I was supposed to be doing. And I wonder if I had the right mindset. I wondered if if I pursued the right major. Had I Did I have the right um, focus in my education? Did God really tell me to go to medical school? Did God really tell me to go to that school in the first place? Should I have been studying somewhere else or doing something else? All these things began to come to my mind. And I began to second guess God and second guess myself. And in the midst of my misery, and it was misery, I happened to go to church one night, a late night service at uh, Roger DeCure's church down in Pasadena. What was the name of his church? I forget. And uh, because he would have a broadcast at 11 o'clock. And I remember when we had our church, church service at, at uh, 7 o'clock, we'd get out about 9, and you would hear Elder Cure say, you still have time to get here. And so we jumped in the car and we came down there and he'd never seen me before in his life. I don't think I'd seen him before, but I came to his church and um, he called me out of the audience and he spoke into my life. 
He told me about the anointing that I would have. He told me about the ministry I was going to have. He told me that I was on the right track and God was going to do something great with my life. He just confirmed some things that I already heard. And but you know what? And 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 I knew that I needed a miracle to go back to school, but he didn't even know what I needed, but God spoke through him to tell me God was going to give me what I needed. And so when I encountered the man of God more than once, but when I encountered the man of God, God confirmed that what I heard was right. What I thought him t he told me to tell in the first place was correct. And that jump started my faith so I could trust God and believe God. And did you not know after the man of God spoke into my life, I just happened to be able to get into a, a speech contest that, and I won first place and gave me enough money to go back to school so I could continue my education and pursue my educational goals. Just because the man of God spoke into my life, I was able to believe believe God and trust God. And God will do that for you. When you seek him, when you cry out to him, when you lay before him, he will send you a word. And I have to tell you this, the prophecy comes to encourage you. And, and, and I want to say this, that when it comes to encourage you, you don't have to go look for that encouragement. You don't go have to go chasing a prophet at a prayer meeting or a revival or at a, some kind of conference. You don't have to go force your way to the front of the line, force your way to the front row to make sure he sees you, makes contact with you so he can call you out and say, thus saith the Lord. No, if God has a word from you, you're going to be found. God's word is going to find you. You don't have to go looking for that word because my friends, when you start chasing prophets and chasing evangelists for what you think is a word, you're going to end up in the spirit of error. The Bible talks about that. The spirit of error is walking in what you thought was truth, but was yet deception of the enemy. And many times, because we don't take the time to do our diligence to seek the Lord through reading the Bible, through praying and fasting and seeking God, and we want a quick fix, so we go find a prophet to tell to prophesy us about our, out of our dilemma, we find ourselves in error because we did not take the time to seek the Lord for our sales. Again, he comes to confirm. What else? The spirit of prophecy comes to encourage. Encouragement. When the prophetic gift of encouragement of working is working, God uses the individual to speak good things into your life. And usually it's a terms of endearment. It's different from the helping gift of encouragement because that happens more on the natural basis. But the gift of encouragement, when it's in the prophetic, it's supernatural because when the prophetic gift is working, uh, the person speaks to you uh, and will tell you uh, about how God feels about you, how much you mean to God, and how and he'll tell you uh, the secrets of your heart, how much you love God. He'll tell you about the things that you might be facing in your life, the obstacles, which you may he may not have even known and could not have known unless they were revealed the Holy Spirit. That's why we call it prophecy. And when the prophetic is working in your life, it strengthens you in the moment and, de and, and declares to you what God is about to do in your situation if he's not doing it already. So the prophetic dimension of encouragement is a powerful dimension that comes to, again, build up God's people. You're going to see that a lot tonight. Build up, encourage, build up, strengthen. This comes to strengthen you. And all of us have had times in our lives when while our spirits were heavy and our heads were hanging low and we didn't think we were going to make it and we weren't sure if we were going to survive. But then somebody came into our lives to encourage us. Somebody, God sent somebody that could see the silver lying in our dark cloud. God sent somebody to tell us that the glass was not half empty, but half full. God sent somebody somebody in our lives just to say, baby, it's going to be all right. God's going to bless you. God's going to work it out. And sometimes you just need to hear that. God's going to bless you. God's going to work it out. You just need a word of encouragement. And that's what this prophetic gift is all about. What else does the prophetic gift come to do? It comes to comfort. Prophecy comes to comfort us. We com we get comfort because we're devastated. We can be devastated many times because of loss, and many times that loss is because of bereavement. And sometimes, um, many times, 
uh, when people are bereaved, that's the time when saints come to help, but they end up putting their foot in their mouth because they end up saying something that's incredibly stupid and unuseful that it makes the person who is supposed to be comforted feel worse than they did before the person came knocking on their door. Um, well, you need to understand, I just want to be straight with you. Uh, you got to be careful about comforting folk. And when you're comforting folk, uh, the worst thing you can do is try to get deep and spiritual and start thumping them with a whole bunch of scripture because that's not what they need right now. If you're going to comfort folks, you need to understand that there is an anointing of comfort. Write it down. There's an anointing of comfort. Isaiah 50 and 4. He says, the Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. So God gives us the anointing to comfort. But along with the anointing of comfort is the wisdom of the Holy Ghost. Because with that gifting of comfort comes wisdom to say the right thing at the right time. I hope you're listening to me tonight. The right thing at the right time. When Ezekiel came to the captives in Babylon, he came with the word from the Lord. But he said, before I did anything, I sat where they sat. He said, I sat where they were in the river bank. I absorbed their pain. I felt their sorrow. I understood their grief. And after sitting where they sat, realizing where they were, understanding their dilemma, then he was able to speak into their lives. And sometimes you got to sit where people are sitting before you can grieve with them. Sit where they sit. Comfort them by just your presence can do much more than your words. Sometimes you got to sit and feel their pain, understand their sorrow. They may be mad. They may be frustrated. They may even cuss because of where they are right then. But don't judge them. Don't condemn them. Don't say you in sin. You need to repent. You sin. No, sit there. Love on them. Just be there with them. And then after you sit where they sat, and you've been with them and you buy them a hamburger, sit there and watch a movie with them. It just be, just sit there with them. And then somebody say then, then God will give you a word to comfort them. Now, if they're on the edge of the cliff, then God may give you a word sooner. But sometimes you got to bond with people before you can speak into their lives. And the Holy Spirit gives you the understanding and the wisdom through that gift of prophecy to bond with that person. <laughs> you can speak into their lives. I wish I had a friend church today. You got to realize that you got to hear God until you can speak into the lives of people, but you got to have the wisdom of God so they'll receive the word that you have for them. That brings us to the gift of, oh, one more thing about prophets. Prophets always are in complete agreement with the word of God. When prophecy is going forth, it never actually ever uh goes against what is written in scripture. And prophecy is never used to shame or belittle anybody who's receiving it. When you see a prophet that's shaming and clowning folks, that's not prophecy. That's not the spirit of God. The spirit of prophecy is submits itself, listen, to the authority of the church. There it is again. When you have a renegade prophet that does not submit himself or herself to the authority of the church, that prophet is working potentially in the spirit of Jezebel. I'm going to say that again. The spirit of Jezebel is that renegade prophetic spirit. People that want to get, they want to work in the gift. They may actually have that gift legitimately working in their lives, but they are not subject to leadership. And when that person is in our midst, there's a red flag that goes up because that person will ultimately do damage to the body of Christ because they are not under the authority of the church. If you can't be under the authority of the church, we can't use your gift because you are in a renegade spirit and that is not a God. All right. So let's talk about pastors for a minute. Let me see. I got my slides mixed up here. All right. Pastors, pastors. Um, where will we be without pastors? Pastors are God's shepherds. Pastors are the intercessors of God's people. Uh, let's, let me tell you something about pastors. Um, in the Old Testament, uh, the, the priest entered into the holy place with the names of the 12 tribes on his best. You see those um, little um, uh, 
uh, little stones. Uh, there are 12 of them, four rows of three. And each of those had the names of the 12 tribes. He would go into the holy place and he would take that censer that you see in his hand, that's uh, burning incense, and the smoke, he would, he would, it would come out of the censer and he waved that censer across the altar and he would uh, make intercession for himself or for the people. And uh, the smoke of that um, uh, censer represents the prayers of the saints. And so he was offering the prayers of the saints to God in a sense and praying for the people. So um, he was a chief intercessor of the people. Well, he was really ministering and actually showing us uh, how Jesus worked. Jesus offered the ultimate sacrifice for us. He redeemed us with his own blood. And we are on his heart, just like the high priest uh, had, had the Israel on his heart. And uh, he intercedes, Jesus intercedes for us. The Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Jesus is the great intercessor. He is our high priest and the pastor is the one that leads God's people. He is a chief intercessor. He leads people toward growth and maturity and he feeds the flock of God. Um, he feeds the flock. Um, I believe it's, um, let's see, Jeremiah 3.15. He says, I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. A pastor's got to be Christ-like because Jesus was the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. And there are many people who are pastoring today, but there are far too many of those pastors and pulpits that are not like Christ. In fact, they don't even believe in the Jesus of the Bible. You'd be surprised how many pastors don't believe in the virgin birth, don't believe in uh, the bodily resurrection of Christ. How could you preach the gospel you don't believe? How could you pastor a Christian church that has founded upon this gospel that you don't believe? But yet many people are sitting under men, under women who are seminary trained, who do not believe the basic tenets of faith. It's it's ridiculous. It's it's uh, preposterous. And it's tragic because these people are sitting under people who are bound by ignorance and unbelief. But a pastor has got to be able to feed God's people, which means he's got to be fed by God's people. He's got to be a person that feeds on the word of God, a person that meditates on the word of God both day and night. He's got to be a man that studies his Bible. You can't feed God if you're not studying the scripture. How can you feed people when you don't eat? How can you feed people and you haven't been nourished? How can you feed people and you are malnourished? Therefore, a preacher, a pastor, has got to be one that feeds the people of God, just like a shepherd feeds his sleep. sheep. He is a spiritual father. He leads the people of God on the path of Christian maturity. He disciples them. He motivates them. He challenges them. He equips them. He inspires them. He counsels them. He comforts them. One of the primary responsibilities, again, is to feed them. If you are starving in your church, it's only either because you're not being fed or you're not eating the food that is being set before you. And let me tell you something. Often it's the latter. I've heard so many people say, I'm not getting a fan. I'm going to another church. And you know what? What I found out is your pastor is doing what he's supposed to be doing. You're just not eating the food. And I've heard other people say, well, I've outgrown this ministry. You haven't outgrown that ministry. Stay right where you are. If you hear me on tonight and you think about going somewhere else because you outgrown that ministry, let me tell you something. It may be very well that God has you in that ministry because he wants you to learn something you thought you knew that you don't know. And when you need to humble yourself and say, Lord, show me what I don't know. Because before you think you graduated, you need to go back and look at some basic tenets because you're about to miss what God has for you. Somebody say amen. All right. A good pastor protects his sheep. He acknowledges his responsibility again as the intercessor. Um, so let's talk about that intercessor for a minute. Uh, the pastor who's an intercessor, that means he prays. That means he fasts. That means he seeks God for the congregation. A pastor has to know his flock. He has to understand the hearts of his people. He needs to understand the frustrations of his people. He's got to understand what God is doing among his people. And a good pastor knows better than uh, to 
uh, accepts shallow answers of I'm okay from his flock when he knows they're not okay. A good pastor, I said a good pastor, needs to discern where his people really are. A good pastor knows better than to it think that people are where they're supposed to be when they're really not because they know how to shout they know how to sing he'll say assume everything's okay no a good pastor discerns beyond the facade and the outside act that people are doing he understands what's going on in the hearts of god's people why because he works in the gift of discernment of spirit a good pastor can discern what's happening in the lives of his congregants he understands he looks at the faces of his people and he can understand what's going on in their hearts and minds he can tell by the way they worship the way they dance the way they shout the way they praise what's going on in their lives he can see if they're free or bound he can understand if they're oppressed or walking in deliverance a good pastor somebody say a good pastor a good shepherd can't wear his feelings on his shoulders he's got people that are yell at him he's got people that are scream at him he's got people that are fuss at him he's got people that are talk about him but a good shepherd again somebody say a good shepherd looks beyond all of that stuff all of that rhetoric that smoke and mirrors that people are putting out and he looks deeper and sees the pain and the hurt that's causing them to act out the way they are. A good pastor loves his shepherd. He loves his sheep. A good pastor loves the people that are under his watch. A good pastor doesn't devour the sheep, but he feeds the sheep. Oh, let me say that again. A good pastor does not devour the sheep. He doesn't take advantage of them. He doesn't, um, uh, uh, um, he doesn't, uh, he's not, uh, he doesn't cheat on, he cheat them. He doesn't lie to them. He doesn't deceive them. He doesn't uh, take advantage of them, but he helps them. He protects them. He nurtures them and is, as his own children. Somebody say hallelujah. Uh, pastors have a different kind of prayer life. Let me tell you about a pastor's prayer life. A pastor's prayer life is different from your prayer life because a pastor's prayer life is taken up with praying for the needs of the saints. See, the, the prayers of the laity, people who are not the pastor, they pray for their needs, their family. If they're really mature, they'll pray for a few saints. But when you are a pastor, you are praying a lot of the time. You're spending time in prayer for the church, for the ministry, for the body. What a, a great portion of the pastor's prayer life is interceding mightily for the saints, engaging in spiritual warfare. Again, he protects the flock. When you come to church, you receive a tremendous blessing. You say, "Woo, we had a good time in church today. But you don't know that the pastor and other prayer warriors that partner with him were laying on their faces for most of the night before, preparing for that great outpouring that you experienced on that morning. Because the pastor understands that a lot of the victories that people see in the forefront are won behind the scenes in the prayer closet on his knees. It's not just because um, great people are there that your church is what it is. It's because you have a pastor that's praying for you and an intercessory team working with that pastor that's crying out to God. Also, a pastor is an evangelist. Second Timothy, let me see, uh, four and five, Paul says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. A pastor is a motivational speaker and a life coach. He's the person that pushes you, that helps you move to the next level in your ministry and your relationship. I remember my own dear pastor. I had two pastors in my life before I came to Mount Sinai. Well, three. Uh, pastor uh, Pleas Thomas was my pastor from birth until three years old. And I learned a lot watching my pastor, even as a child, because I admired his style of preaching. And then when I came to Mount uh, to, to, to New Gethsemane Church, Pastor Lemon Penn was the founder of that church. I learned a lot about prayer. I learned about intercession. I learned about uh, walking in the spirit. I learned about the power of the Holy Spirit working in the life of the believer. I learned about missions. I learned about soul winning. So many things I learned watching my pastor. But then Dr. Raymond Watts, who's now Bishop Watts of the New Direction Church, was my pastor. He saw ministry in me before I saw ministry in me. He knew I was called before I was called. He positioned me to receive my calling. He took me to the prison and had me preach to people before I even said I was a preacher. He was the one that guided me. He taught me about praying for the sick. He taught me about uh, ministering to people at the altar. He taught me about 
prayer ministry and the visiting attention of the sick and 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 comforting the the, the bereaved and and counseling people in trouble with their marriages. I learned so much from my pastor because he poured into me. That's what a pastor does. He sees ministry in you. He sees potential in you. A good pastor tries to position you to pull that ministry out of you. My goodness, it's a hard job. Uh, you think you want to be a pastor? It's not for the faint of heart because a lot of people are resistant to what the pastor is trying to do. He sees something in you. He's trying to pull it out of you, but you don't want to do it. And it's a back and forth tug of war. So when you say no, he goes back into his prayer closet and say, God, touch your heart. God, touch your mind. God, give her mind to surrender. She comes back to you. He pulls on you some more. You say no. He goes back to the prayer closet. God, touch your heart. God, touch him until you finally say yes. And then he finally says, Phew. Because he's been crying out to God for you. Please understand that pastors work hard. <laughs> Whew. Pastors work hard trying to pull the body of Christ into a place of usefulness, to be useful in the kingdom of God. Let me move on to teachers. I can talk about pastors all night. Teaching. Teachers can be one of the most, um, have one of the most thankless jobs on the face of the earth. Teachers mold young minds. Teachers shape the thinking of adolescents who soon become adults. Teachers place um, the feet of students on that are willing on the path. Redirect the steps of people who are moving in the wrong direction. Teachers challenge our thinking. Teachers uh, present facts and perspectives that challenge our presuppositions and humble us when we need to be humble because we thought we knew more than we did. Teachers would also build us up and cause us to hold our head up when we uh, lack self-confidence and make us understand that we really knew more than we thought we did. Teachers push us to the limit. They challenge us. They challenge us to go beyond. At the time, it might be frustrated. We may even get a little nerve wracking for us. But when it's all over, we can look back and see that that teacher that was working with us pushed us to a place we thought we could never go. All of us can remember teachers in our lives that really challenged us, that really helped us, that really motivated us to reach for the stars, to reach for our goals, to reach beyond the places we thought we could go. Praise God for those kinds of teachers and people who have uh, that kind of impact on students um, have the gift of teaching. What I've described to you is interaction between teachers in the world uh, with students in the world. But you know what? That same kind of impact should be felt with teachers in the church. Teachers are the ones that do the heavy lifting after the person says yes to the Lord. Teachers are the ones that disciple them. Teachers are the ones that spend protracted hours with new converts, trying to mold them and shape them into strong disciples. Teachers are the ones that help those disciples become fruitful branches in the body of Christ. We need, um, um, we need preaching, but we need te good teaching as well. It's teaching that helps us to eliminate the confusion that brings understanding. It's teaching that imparts those life-changing uh, truths of scripture into our lives and redirects our lives. It's teaching that empowers us with knowledge because knowledge is power. And it's teaching that helps us to re realize that um, uh, because we're in the body of Christ, we have the authority that can actually cause us to do great things in the kingdom of God. Teachers bring these things out. Preachers, teachers bring out this truth. It's teaching that, not, and not just preaching, that helps us understand that our purpose and our uh, passion in ministry is to serve the Lord. And teaching helps you to understand and discover what that purpose is. We're talking about the kind of teaching uh, that makes an impact. I'm not talking about the kind of teaching where I'm just reading out of the Sunday book to the school book to the, te the, pe the people on Sunday morning. I'm talking about a teacher that walks in the power of the Holy Ghost, a teacher that is anointed to illuminate the scriptures to our understanding. Teachers, listen, are a mas are masters of illustration. Jesus was a masterful teacher. The Bible says, without a parable, spake he not unto them. That means every time Jesus taught, he taught using a parable. He taught using a story. A, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Um, lastly, evangelists. Evangelists are the obstetricians of the church. Uh, they are the ones that actually uh, 
bring people to Jesus Christ. Their soul winning is their passion. They submit themselves to the authority of the church. Wherever they are, they're under the authority of the pastor. They come to preach, they come to teach, and they come to bring people to Christ. Billy Graham is one of the greatest evangelists the world has ever seen. I admire his ministry so much. I grew up under his ministry, watching him on television. Oh, what a powerful man of God. What great things he did for God. Millions of souls came to Christ. He was a man that, that could literally hold the attention of a man in the White House and a man in the Bush the country of Africa at the same time. That's the kind of power he had. I personally believe he was spirit filled. You don't have to agree with me, but when I see his broadcast and I watch his tapes and I listen to his broadcast, I can feel the power of God and I can feel the presence of God in his preaching. Um, I just thank God for his ministry because he is uh, a powerful evangelist. I think Greg Laurie is a great evangelist. He's a pastor, but also his passion is soul winning. And he does great things for God with his harvest festivals every year and harvest fest every year. And we need to know um, and understand that evangelists have a very great um, uh, gifting that is useful to the body of Christ. Now let's go back to the text and finish it up. He says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Let's read it in the New Living Translation. This will continue, I'm sorry, their responsibility is to equip God's people. Your Bible says perfecting, it says to equip God's people. The, the purpose of the fivefold ministries, evangelists, prophets, pastors, teachers, apostles, are to equip the people of God to do work. That's what the uh, uh, gifts are there for, to help the people of God to be equipped to work in their ministry. They're there to build, to encourage, to strengthen, to lift up so we can answer the calling that's upon our lives and equip us, empower us to work in our ministries, to build up the church. There it is again. Over and over we see, build up, build up, edifying. We are, they are there to edify the church, to build us up so we could be strengthened and do the work of the kingdom. And uh, he says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Um, the, whole, the, the whole idea of the five vote ministries, the whole purpose is to make strong disciples. That's what the gifts are given to us for, to edify the church, to make strong disciples. Our vision at the Mount Sinai Church is that every member of our church will become a faithful, focused, and fruitful disciple of Christ. So that's why we, we embrace the fivefold ministries. Well, I'm praying that God will raise up pastors. I'm praying that God will raise up evangelists and teachers and prophets in our church because we need all of those ministries in our church in order to build us up and to equip us for ministry. The church must be equipped. The church must be empowered to answer God's call and to do the things he's commanded us to do so we can reach that oikos we've been talking about for so long. Praise the Lord. That's all I have for you on tonight. Do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Oh, let's have the questions. All right. So, <clears throat> pardon me. First question we have here uh, is, are some people graced to prophesy but don't have the gift? Yes. The gift of prophecy is different from the office of prophecy. The office of a prophet is what's happening here. I think I should have made that clear. The gift of prophecy is different from the office of a prophet. The office, these are offices, the office of a teacher, the office of an apostle, the office of a pastor, the office of evangelist, the office of a prophet. A prophet it works in that office. That's his office in the church. That's his hierarchy of authority in the church. But the gift of prophecy works on many people, and God moves on many people to prophesy. And the Bible tells us to cover to prophesy. Again, we intersect with the gift of prophecy in, in every group of gifts that we run into, whether it be the helping gifts in Romans or the power gifts in 1 Corinthians or the fivefold ministry gifts here in Ephesians. You run into the prophecy over and over again, over again. Most certainly, we can be graced to prophesy. The Bible says desire to prophesy. It's right to ask God, Lord, I want to prophesy. It's right, it's right to ask God for that because you need that. We need that in the church. All right. And uh, reading through some of the comments here, I just wanted to comment, Pastor, that many are thanking God for you for being a great pastor, one who is shepherding and feeding God's people. Praise God. 
And I will add to that and say that anybody who's running to be a pastor is a fool. <laughs> Considering the hard work and the diligence that you must give to ministry. Praise God. Amen. Love you all so much. Uh, so next question, this goes with uh, what you just gave as an answer. Yes. Um, talks about, uh, oh, okay, uh, is it just semantics or are offices different from gifts? Yes, offices are very different from gifts because the gifts work on occasion and sometimes rare occasion. Gifts work, work in situations. You see me? I'm sorry. Gifts work in situations. You're in a situation where the gift needs to work. God is going to operate on you for that gift. Um, when we go to Africa, um, when we go to the Philippines, that's a prime example of where the gifts work. Um, I remember um, years ago, there's my lovely wife, how you doing? Um, um, we were in the Philippines and uh, we were praying for this young man um, who had a leg that was shorter than the other. And my daughter laid hands on this young man while we were praying. And we saw that I saw this guy's leg grow out. And it, was, it wasn't one of those, you know, f fake phony um, things that you see on TV. This dude, his leg grew out. I, we saw it. The gift of healing was working. Now, my daughter doesn't claim to work in that gift, but God worked in her life because she was an agent of God's healing power at that moment. And I thank God for that. That was a, just one situation where God actually moved and worked wonderfully in her life. Um, there are other times when I've seen God use people in the gift of prophecy. I've seen God use people in the gift of, of healing again because there, it was a situation where we need God needed a vessel. And when God needs a vessel and there's a vessel that's willing to be used, he will anoint that vessel. I've seen people preach who don't usually preach, but God anointed them to preach because God needed a vessel. Gifts often come upon us supernaturally at times because God needs a vessel for a specific time for a specific purpose. All right. And the next question we have, can God give prophecy to one who's not a prophet, for instance? I think we just talked about yeah, that. Yeah, the pastors sometimes move in words of wisdom or words of knowledge as do others who are not pastors. Yes, I guess. <laughs> yes. Um, I've been taught, the way I've been taught is that um, every pastor should seek to work on all the gifts mm -hmm. because you are the leader. Your people will never rise higher than you are where you are. If you don't want to receive from the Lord, they're not going to receive from the Lord. If you don't believe the scriptures, they won't believe the scriptures. If you don't stretch on faith, they won't stretch out on faith. And so a pastor should seek that. And I believe that a pastor should be open to being used in any and all the gifts of the spirit. And I believe pastors often are used in many of the gifts of the spirit because God has to work. I believe a pastor has to give the gift of faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to believe, thank God for miracles for the, for the ministry. And God does that. I mean, we're, we're walking in a miracle right now at Mount Sinai. Um, God has ne never blessed us the way he has. Um, and we've been very transparent about the finance. But God is doing some great things financially for the church during the pandemic when we should have been barely scraping the bottom of the barrel. God is doing great things because we believe God. I mean, we had to trust God. And I, I didn't even spend a lot of time praying about it. But God just did it. Because it just, I just decided, I just believed that God was going to take care of the church, and he did. I guess that was a gift of faith. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Um, I've seen God do it in the mission field. We didn't know how we want to get through um, uh, customs. They confiscated our stuff. <laughs> and we had to work in the gift of faith. And the gift of faith unlocked the door and made the people give us our stuff back so we could do ministry in the field. I mean, I, God uses pastors in different places, different things. But, but what I want to encourage you is, let's not talk about the pastor. I want to talk about you tonight because what I want you to understand is you have the potential to work on all of these gifts. And, 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 and if you yield yourself to God, you will be amazed at what God does for you. A lot of people, and the Lord just showed me this this afternoon, a lot of people are not walking in the fullness of their gift because of one word, and that's the fear. They're afraid. They're afraid of being embarrassed. They're afraid of being intimidated. They're afraid of failing. 
They're afraid of being humiliated. And so they're, they're afraid of what will happen if they pray and nothing happens. But you know what? we got to break that stronghold tonight of fear because fear will keep you locked up and cause you to live beneath your privilege and keep you from being used to your full potential. We're going we're gonna to pray for that tonight before we leave. We're going to bind the spirit of fear because there are some people listening to me tonight that need to break that bondage in your life and step out onto the, dark, the waters, just like Peter told Jesus told Peter, launch out into the deep and, and cash it on the other side. You need to launch out into the deep. Somebody tonight, I'm talking to you tonight. You need to launch out into the deep. You need to let go of your fear and your inhibition. Stop comparing yourself to everybody else. Stop comparing yourself to the ministries you see on television and hear on radio and, and hear um, uh, and, and on, on video and, and say, God, however you want to use me, it's okay with me. God, I'm willing to be used. And God, whatever you have for me, that's what I receive. Don't compare what you got to somebody else because God gave you what he gave you to be used just the way he wants it to be used in your life. Because there's somebody that's going to be reached. They can only be reached by God using you the way he uses you. And if you don't answer the call, somebody may not make it in to the kingdom because you didn't say yes to God. I don't know about you, but I don't want that on my conscience. I want to make sure that I answer every call, that I walk through every door, that I obey every command that God has for me because there are souls that are depending on your ministry. Amen. Amen. I want to interject a question here and ask, how does prayer play in cultivating those gifts? So the more time you spend in the presence of God, the more powerful you become. Um. We've seen so many people, the, uh, the saints uh, that we, we, we revere as prayer warriors. I don't know anybody weak in their faith that is a prayer warrior. I don't know anybody that doesn't, does not walk in power that is a prayer warrior because prayer warriors walk in power because dwelling in the, in the presence of God accommodates and positions you to receive and walk in the power of God. And the power of God in your life is a direct result of you being in his presence. Moses was in the presence of God for 40 days. When he came out, he was irradiating with the power of God. Paul spent time in the presence of God. He walked in miracles. Peter was spending time in the presence of God, praying. While he was praying and meditating, that's when those fellows from Joppa showed up. They showed up in Joppa and knocked on the door. He knew who they were and what they wanted before they came to the door. And he walked in the power of God that day. Whenever we see men walking, spending time in the presence of God, they had the power of God in their lives. The presence of God stays in the life of people who love to hang out with God. If you want God's power, learn how to hang out with him. Learn how to spend time with him. Because I guarantee you, your expectations will not be disappointed. Amen. Um, this question has been answered, but I just want to uh, pick this up again. Uh, this person says, I guess the corollary is this, do I have to be a prophet of God, for God, to give a prophetic message? Absolutely not. Again, the office of a prophet is different from the gift of the prophecy. The office of the prophet is someone who is works in the prophetic office. He trains other prophets. He works in, in a, a consortium with the pastor to do ministry in the church. You know, he's a leader in the church working in that prophetic office probably a, has a pastoral gift with him himself. So the office of a prophet actually sometimes intersects with the office of, of, the, uh, of the pastorate and the teacher. So there are many teachers that have prophetic ministries. So they kind of runs together. But the gift of prophecy is available to all believers who are baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I, I strongly encourage you, pray for it. You have not because you ask not. If we would pray for these things, God would do these things. But if we sit on the sideline and think that we can never be me, then you'll be disappointed. And let me just say this. Stop thinking yourself unworthy. Stop thinking that you don't measure up. I heard a pastor uh, last couple of nights ago, and I, I loved what he said. He said, we need to move beyond the experience of the Holy Ghost baptism and learn how to fellowship with the Spirit. The Bible talks about the communion of the Holy Ghost. He wants to commune with you and fellowship with you. 
And sometimes we're intimidated by thinking. Is there something I hear? Mm -hmm. Okay. I hear you. Oh, I hear me? Okay. <laughs> There's, um, there, there is a, um, okay. So what happens is um, you have the communion of the Holy Spirit, which is fellowship. And sometimes people are intimidated by that term Holy Spirit because the first thing that comes to their mind, well, I'm not holy enough. I'm not righteous enough. I made too many mistakes. I messed up too much. I don't live a clean enough life. So I can't commune with them like that. You know, he's not going to hang out with me like that. Yes, he will. God isn't waiting for you to get perfect to hang out with you. God isn't waiting for you to get perfect and cleaned up to spend time with you. You know, it's in his presence that we're cleansed. It's in his presence that we're purged. It's in his presence that he works that stuff out. It's in his presence that he molds us and shapes us and refines our character. And it's the trick of the enemy to keep you away from the presence of God, thinking you're not good enough. When in fact, the Holy Spirit is, is practically begging you with his hands out, say, hey, come here. Let me love on you. Let me talk to you. Let me fellowship with you. You're over there thinking you're not good enough. And the whole time he's over here saying, hey, I'm over here. Come over here. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop telling yourself that. Stop saying that about yourself. That's not what I think about you. Forget about what the devil says. Listen to what I say. And the Bible says, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Stop believing the devil's report. Believe what God says about you. I'm getting to another message. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, next question is, does it mean or what does it mean if a pastor doesn't see anything, ministry, within you if he never positions you? Well, what I would say is get to know your pastor a little better. Sometimes, um, let me just speak as a pastor, I try to fellowship with folks and they run away from me. Um, I try to embrace them and they're resistant. Um, and as you have a growing church, it's harder and harder to have that personal touch. But sometimes you need to reach out and get to know your pastor. Talk to your pastor. I always hear you all say, you're too busy. I'm not too busy. I would answer your phone call. If, that, if, you, get a, if you get a voicemail, call me back. It's okay. Or you'll call me. Or I'll call them back. <laughs> Text me. Leave me a message in the office. Call my wife. We want to talk to you. We want to minister to you. We want to bless you. And, and sometimes it's just through that fellowship together that God will begin to speak to me about you. And I'll begin to speak into your life. Now, I'm not saying come to me for your free prophecy. I'm not saying uh. that. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is give your shepherd an opportunity. And and, and another thing, sometimes it's not going to be the shepherd that speaks into your life. Oh, I, I feel that in the Holy Ghost. God has empowered other people in the ministry around the pastor who represent the pastor to speak into your life. Sunday school teacher, minister, missionary. There are people God has empowered to speak into your life. But you got to sit still enough and be visible enough for somebody to speak into your life. If you're not present, it's hard for people to connect with you. And if you're one of those folks that come around every now and then, it's hard to develop a relationship, isn't it? And in this online experience we've got, it's even more of a challenge. That's why it's so necessary to stay connected to the body. Because the more connected you are, the more likely you are to find out what God has called you to do whether it be through the pastor, the first lady, or someone else. If, when God has a word from you, it's going to find you. Okay, so let me, let, me, let me back up a little bit. So the question was, what if your leader is not? Um, what if your leader is, does not see anything within you or if he, if he never positions you? Okay, so what that means is my prayer life needs to change. If I really want to be used, and I've really yielded to God, I'm saying, Lord, any way you bless me, any way you want to use me, it's okay with me. God, I yield myself to you. I'm committed to you. And, I'm, and make yourself available. And then ask God to open your eyes. Because sometimes it's not so much the leader saying, hey, you need to do this. Sometimes it's the Holy Spirit opening your eyes and making you alert to a need in the church. One of the things that's really challenging for us right now is staffing ministries 
throughout the church because we still got a lot of people that are staying home for whatever reason. And so we got a lot of people doing a lot of work, but we still have a lot of deficits and vacuums of leadership and ministry because we have trouble with people filling those gaps. And let me tell you something. It's not so much for me sometimes to look and say, sister, so-and-so, would you take this over, brother, so-and-so, would you do this? It's you hearing the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and saying, pastor, I see this need. I would like to work in this area. Pastor, I see this burden on you. I want to help you with this. Pastor, I saw this ministry over here that needs some help. I would like to do this. That's the kind of attitude that we need to have. Because as you let God open your eyes, he's going to show you where you can be useful. So don't so much wait for the leader to speak to you. You got to make the first move. You need to make yourself available. You need to step into the water and start working. And as you start working and start laboring, then it'll all begin to open up. And we'll see you. We'll talk to you. You talk to us. And God will make it real to you and us where he, what he has for you. Sometimes in order to get you where you need to be in ministry, God's got to start you in another place. You know, being an usher may not be your final destination, but that's where God wants to start you. Being a Sunday school teacher may not be your final destination, but that's where God wants to start you. But if you're not willing to start at those areas, you may not be able to embrace what God has for you later. Sometimes it's taking that step of obedience to do the menial task and the insignificant things and the things we don't see as as important or glamorous. That's the test of obedience and character. And being when we walk into those things and be faithful of those things, then God opens other doors and creates other opportunities for you to be not just elevated, but actually get further into the workings of the ministry. But you got to start somewhere. And sometimes it's you that got to make the first move. It's not so much you being positioned, it's you being willing to work and saying, where can I be used? Amen. Look around. God, open my eyes. Look at them. Let me see what's happening. Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look. For the harvest is ripe and ready for harvest. God, open my eyes. David said, open thou my eyes, that I may see and behold wonderful things. Amen. Amen. Uh, another question here, and I'm going to stand my lane and just ask questions, sure, but sure. I'm just feel inclined to respond to what you just talked about mm-hmm. and uh, and say that, you know, a lot of times we assume that pastor does not see those gifts in us. And I can remember Dr. Mayfield saying that every shed eye isn't, uh, every, clo- every close eye isn't shed, right? So, you know, they may see and may not say anything to you, you, you but it, I think it's important, like you said, that you be found serving. Right. And uh, I can remember calling my own self. When I felt led or called into ministry, uh, this was prior to coming to Mount Sinai, mm-hmm. but I went to my pastor when I felt that calling after praying for, about it for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, he never came to me. And I think some people wait for this mystical, spooky experience. Like I've been called, so pastor's going to come and call me out or something. Right. But, you know, sometimes I think it's OK for us to go to our pastor and say, this is what I'm feeling. Right. Absolutely. Matter of fact, that's how it happens most of the time is you saying, Pastor, I feel led to do this and so. And what I've been praying every day, every day, I'm saying, Lord, touch the hearts of your people. Cause them to see the areas of ministry that we need. Lord, send somebody to help us with the children's ministry. God, send somebody to help us with the greeters. Send somebody to help us with the usher. Send somebody to help us with um, the hospitality. God, these are the areas that we need help. We need more deacons, God. A lot of our deacons are getting old, they're hard, getting harder to walk. We need some brothers that will step in. Lord, touch the hearts of your people because everybody's kind of sitting around watching everybody else. And we need people that would labor in the church and, and, and step into areas of ministry that are necessary. So, my, my dears, there's plenty to do. <laughs> there's plenty of opportunity. You just need to step, step up and, and, and volunteer and say, God, use me. Amen. All right. So next question is, uh, I see two more. Uh, okay. So should we consider Sunday school teachers that are called to be teachers as described in the list that you talked about earlier? I think so. I think there are some, some exceptionally gifted teachers who are Sunday school teachers. Yes, I think so. And the next question is, how can we as a church make room for people to operate in their gifts? How can we as a church, make room, make more room for people to operate in their gifts? All right. That's a good question. Now, first of all, um, 
there are, there, are, there are a few ways you can do that. Number one is get involved in Sunday school because Sunday school provides a small group setting. Can making connections with the people in your small group setting it gives you an opportunity to minister to them, to speak into their lives, the prophetic word, the word of encouragement, uh, the, the, the gift of, uh, of, um, uh, of benevolence, um, the gift of helps. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Those are wonderful opportunities to minister to people. Um, during the church service, if we're, if we're ministering to people, now as time goes on, we'll probably be able to expand our service a little bit more. We're kind of tight at the 10 o'clock, but with a little more latitude at the, at the 12 o'clock. Listen, if God tells you to get up and pray for somebody, go pray for them. It's all right. You're not out of order. Pray for them. Go speak into their lives when the spirit is moving. Go do that. And we're praying that God gives us more opportunities where we, we might be able to um, um, uh, let those gifts come forth. Um, as we start our small group ministry on Wednesday night after Bible study, which is going to be the new format in a few months, um, we'll be able to have that same kind of opportunity. The, the opportunities are there and will continue to uh, evolve um, because um, the ministry continues to grow and to evolve. But at the same time, um, make the connection with people. Um, sometimes you need to make a phone call. Sometimes you need to contact somebody. Sometimes God will put somebody on your mind during your prayer time. You need to obey the spirit of God and speak to them and do, tell them what, tell that person what God told you. So sometimes it's not so much the opportunity for the gift to work in the church, but it may be an opportunity for the gift to work because you're obedient and reach out to the person that needs the ministry. But we'll look forward to other, to other times and opportunities because God will do that for us. Okay. I have a question. Uh, someone on the YouTube chat stated that prophecy builds. Is there a difference between modern day prophecy and the prophecy of the Old Testament? Well, the Old Testament prophets seem to be prophets of doom. <laughs> mm. um, they, were, they, they worked in the in the area of, of um, uh, declaring the word of the Lord, which was also often a word of judgment. Um, and when the Lord would send words of judgment upon his people, it was because of their misdoings. But then when they would repent, the prophet would bring a word of gladness and a word of encouragement. And many times, even when the Lord sent that word of judgment, before the prophet was done, he would end it on a high note by speaking and declaring God's love for his people and what he would do for them even after he had allowed calamity to come upon them. So even in the Old Testament, we see even though God was a God of judgment and the prophet worked as the, as the mouthpiece of God's judgment, we also see God's grace in the prophet's mouth. In the New Testament, we see more of the grace of God and less of the judgment because the New Testament, again, we're living in the dispensation of grace. And that's why Paul said the gift of the prophecy comes for what? For edification, for encouragement, for comfort. So these are the primary workings of prophecy. When God sends a prophet to condemn you in these days and time, you've done a whole lot to, if, to solicit that kind of response from the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit has to clown you in front of the masses hmm. <laughs> and shame you to get you to understand something, and I've seen him do it. It's because you've been so recalcitrant and so hard-headed, so disobedient and so unhearing and uncaring and unresponsive to the Holy Spirit that you force his hand. You you made God go there <laughs> because it will make you come down. Right, <laughs> right. You made him come down there because that's just that's not how God prefers to work among His people and people who call themselves prophets who practice shaming and embarrassing, humiliating. Are not again. I'm gonna say it again. Are not working in the Holy Ghost because that's not the gift. How the gift works. Can I answer the question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you have another one? I don't see any more. Okay. Um, we are instructed to stir up the gifts, stir up our gifts. Is there a consequence for believers who fail to stir up their gifts? Well, if the Bible says stir it up and you let it lay dormant. What is that? Omission. <laughs> okay. What's mm -hmm. another word for that? 
How about disobedience? <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we walk in disobedience, we're mm. sinning against the Lord. Be it ever so small, as we may call it. But when we refuse to work on our gift, when we refuse to stir it up, when we sit on our gift, when we sit on our calling, people go without. People are disenfranchised in the ministry because we're not walking in obedience. One thing I've really learned in my life is I must walk in obedience. And I, if I if I disobey the Lord, I feel very ugly on the inside. I don't know about you. It's a very ugly feeling to know that I disobey God. I hate feeling like that. I and I that's why I want to walk in obedience. Just I hate feeling that. And I guess it's good that you have that feeling because when you get to the point where you don't feel anything, you're gonna disobey God and just shun the Holy Spirit and do despite to the spirit of grace and just going about your business and act like he's not talking to you, God will turn your life upside down and say, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Because again, you made him go there. The Bible says, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chasing the Lord. We might not be condemned to the world. We would save ourselves a whole lot of whoopings if we would just say yes to the Lord, which brings me all back to your point. You better stir up that gift. <laughs> If he says stir it up, and you know what it is, you need to stir it up. And you know what? I'll say one more thing. I'll let it alone. Sometimes we don't stir up our gift because we're shy, we're bashful. But you know what? That's actually being selfish. We're, we're too concerned about us and not concerned about the people who may benefit from what we have to offer. Think about you, not just yourself. But think about others around you. There's a need in the body of Christ for the gift that you have. There's a need in the body of Christ for the ministry that God has given you. You need to stir that thing up. Okay, and that leads to another question. Um, some individuals in the church were reared and taught and trained about using their gifts while others receive very little training or pushing at all. So can you speak to the individuals who receive little training about their gifts? Well, it's always good to have times of instruction like this when we're talking about the gifts because they, they give us an opportunity to educate ourselves about how they, how they work and why, why they're important. Um, it's good to, to have these conversations, but then it's good to to seek and pursue. When you, when you when you run into this kind of information, the next step is to go back into your prayer closet and say, Lord, how does this apply to me? God, help me to stir up my gift. God, help me to identify my gifts. By the way, next week, Lord willing, we're going to be taking a test on spiritual gifts. I'm going to walk you through that process. Matter of fact, let me give you this um, website. website. It's mm -hmm. spiritualgifts.com. Come on, let me see that. That's it. Spiritualgifts.com or gifts.com. Spiritual gifts test? Yes. Yeah. Okay, it's a free spiritual gifts test. It'll take you about 15 minutes. It's answer the questions. And when you answer all the questions, then you push submit. It'll tell you what all your spiritual gifts are. Or what they might be. Can you post that site? Mm -hmm. Okay, I want I would like everybody to 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 get that website. Take that test this week. Come back to the broadcast next week so we can talk about your spiritual gifts because we're going to be talking about some other gifts called the helping gifts um, next week, and and uh, we want to see uh, what gifts you have, and I want you to interact with me on the broadcast so we can see what gifts you discover that you have. And we're gonna pray and ask God to stir up those gifts that you have. It's a pretty amazing test. This is the first time I ever took it. I've heard about it for years, but I never took it until last night. Hmm. It's pretty amazing. Hmm. And the example was given of Pastor Hilliard, for instance, in Houston, how it seems like his daughter was always pushed hmm. into using her gift. And we always saw him pushing his daughter. Uh, another example was given of Bishop Jakes, 
And it seems like these individuals are kind of further ahead because they receive such a huge push uh, in their upbringing in regards to utilizing their gifts. And it causes some to feel like um, their gift is not as developed because they never received that push. So as your pastor, I'm committed to pushing you as much as I can. Mm -hmm. But what I need from you, what we need from you is get in there and work somewhere. Help, help us in the church. Help us fill some of these gaps. Help us fill some of these holes in ministry. I, I hope you, some of you that are coming back to church can appreciate how difficult it is to staff the services on Sunday morning. And we still haven't revamped our children's ministry, frankly, because we don't have anybody that's willing to work there. Um, we have Sister Erin, our dear sister, and our little baby sister, Natalie, who actually do every Sunday online. We don't have a staff that has stepped up and says, I want to help pull this children's ministry up and start working it again. We need that help. We need help in the youth department. We need help. Sister Kay is doing that all by herself. He needs people that are willing to help her. I mean, that list goes on and on. The re, the, 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 the outreach ministry, Sister Neely has not been well for several months. And Brother Neely's had to shut it down because he's had nobody to help it. Where are the people to help? To help with the food ministry, to help distribute to the people. See, see these are the kinds of things we need to help with. And, and so you're saying, push me. But God's saying, open your eyes. Because you're saying, I want to be like, be like Bishop Jakes and push me. I'm being, I'm being your pastor and pushing you saying, look, babe, open your eyes. Look around. We need your help in the ministry. We need ushers on the floor. We haven't really had ushers on the floor for a couple of weeks. Yeah, one or two every week. And the deacons have had to fill in some of those holes because we need help. It requires some humility because some really want the power. It yes. does. It requires <laughs> humility. That's the thing. I said that when we first opened the door, that when well, the door is in March, that it's going to take humility and understanding that there's some jobs that need to be done in the church that I'm going to have to do that may not be in the limelight. But I, if I'm faithful there, God will use me somewhere else. And I'm saying to you is, you want to be used and somebody to push in your gift, work where you are needed now and doors will open later on. Don't put the cart before the horse. And that's the problem. A lot of people want to jump right in there into the spotlight. Babe, that's not how it works. Okay, let me testify. Can I testify? So you, 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 you made me go there. Okay. <laughs> okay. My wife and I come from churches where we were taught to give service wherever we could. Her mother taught her, my mother taught me, when you are asked to serve, you serve gladly. You don't serve with an attitude. And whatever you served, I, I served as an usher, I served as a junior deacon, I served as a choir member, I served as a YPWW president, I was a Sunday school teacher, I was a drummer, yeah, I was. Um, <laughs> um, I was a choir director. Um, I was a youth pastor. I was a children's pastor. Um, mm -hmm. I was a social pastor. I mean, listen, I was the custodian of the church for many years. I had a college education and I was cleaning the toilets of the church every week because that was a job that I needed to have right then. It was paying, right? So I needed that job and I did it willingly. And I did, I was, I was a preacher and ordained to preach in the church, but I was cleaning toilets because it needed to be done, okay? And I did it gladly. I was, I was a unskilled laborer in the church doing construction and swinging a, a sledgehammer and knocking down plaster and, and putting stuff together. I, was, I crawled on my belly in the dirt, running cables for the uh, microphones. I was, I was, um, I was a uh, uh, audio technician for the church um, for many years. Um, Went to the prison. I, I, I was a prison uh, ministry leader, a worker. Um, it, it goes on and on and on. I, I, nursing I, home. I worked in nursing home. Mm -hmm. Forgot about that. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in the nursing home. 
it, it, uh, for a Christian organization, or Roberts University, I, I wipe people's behind and scrub them and and fed them, and and these are people who are calling calling me the CNA to the DM. right, calling me <laughs> calling me um um N I G G E R while I was cleaning them. But but I'm I'm trying to tell you I've been through all of that, but I learned how to serve wherever I was, and God blessed me and opened doors for me. Because I, I didn't wait for somebody to push me. I told you Bishop pushed me. But before Bishop pushed me, I was already working. So my work ethic in the church brought me to his attention to take a closer look at me so he could see what was in me. But if I was lazy and stuck up and, and full of myself, I never would have had those opportunities. Because I thought I was too, I would have thought I was too good to do these things. I think I'm talking to somebody tonight. Amen. So 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 let, let's 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 turn it around here. Okay. Find out where you can be used. Look and see where you can be utilized. And if you just don't see it, then come to Sister Rona and I say, hey, what can I do? Baby, I will find you something to do because we need help. Yes. I was gonna say, I think we share share the same resume, just about. I know we do, I, yes. I didn't I wasn't a CNA though. Tell us. <laughs> I can recall my grandmother. I walked in on my grandmother talking to my old first lady and saying, oh, Daryl knows how to do that. <laughs> she just volunteered me to do that. Yeah, yeah, I got volunteered to do a lot of stuff. I remember that. <laughs> but it was graphic design, and I had absolutely no clue whatsoever what how to do graphic design. And it was something that I kind of got thrown into and don't consider myself a pro by any standard or by any measure, but it's something I love to do now for the church and it's taken me before a lot of great people. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things too that that is worth talking about in this day that we live in mm -hmm. is that anytime anybody picks up a broomstick in the church, they expect to be you paid. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's just a dangerous mindset. Mm -hmm. it is, yes. I need mm -hmm. to be paid. Uh, that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. If if you really want to be used of God, get the paycheck conversation off your mind. Okay. Work in the church. Be faithful to what you're called to do first. Okay. That's where it starts. Where is your heart? What's your motive? What's your reason for wanting to do this? Because it's really a matter of the heart. A servant leader is what we need to be. We need to be servant leaders. Amen. I mean, that means anything I'm asked to do, wherever I'm asked to work, that's why I work. That's that's why I labor, because I'm a labor. I'm a willing worker. Well, we need YBWW back again, don't we? <laughs> Young people, willing workers. That we learn how to be willing workers. We need help too. The youth. Yeah, they do. Well, how mm. dare we ask God for a gift? Mm. And, then and, and then turn around and, and charge people. Yeah. Mm. Mission field. Mm -hmm. um, I had a statement from the individual who asked about if the pastor doesn't see anything, you did answer that, but then they were piggybacking on something Elder Hill said about prayer cultivating your gift. Mm -hmm. And they stated that. Um, as you're praying and seeking God, listening to God, you'll find yourself no longer waiting on man to call you because the Lord has called you and you'll hear that in prayer. And the individual stated that uh, when she was down on her back, the Lord began to deal with her and show her these types of things. So when you have a listening ear, sometimes you have to cultivate that sensitivity to the Lord's voice because he definitely will speak and direct you. Absolutely. Um, then I had another question about singing prophetically. Uh, we had a few questions that came. Do you have to be a prophet to operate in prophecy? Uh, someone asked the question about, can you sing and prophesy through your singing? Oh, absolutely. Go to first mm. Chronicles chapter 20, turn 21. The Bible talks about David, and the Bible says that he made instruments and he taught the Levites to play on the instruments, and they prophesied on their instruments. They prophesied, the singers prophesied in their singing. Um, the psalmists prophesied in their songwriting. 
Um, they were singing their songs. They were prophesying in their singing. The Psalms, many of them are messianic Psalms, which means they were prophetic Psalms. They spoke of and described the ministry of Jesus before he came to the earth. So the psalmists who wrote the songs and sang the songs were themselves prophets working in the ministry of music. So by all means, a psalmist can be a prophetess. Yeah. And a statement was made in the chat, Lord, help us to walk in the gifts you have put in us with obedience and confidence in you and not in ourselves. Hallelujah. And uh, that's so important in this, this new age day where there's so much reliance on self and mm -hmm. so much uh, being said about self, self, self. <laughs> but we should keep our confidence in the Lord. Did you get any more, Elder Hill? I see no more. Well, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> wow, y'all came, came back strong this week. <laughs> Last week, I had one question. And that was somebody trying to be nice. <laughs> so listen, give your offer tonight. Cash out. Give a five. MassonicCoaching.org. Click giving. Um, call the church tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> make your offering over the phone. Give your offering over the phone. But uh, we certainly want to uh, thank you for joining us on tonight. To our guests, both here and far away, God bless you. We're so glad and uh, pleased that you joined us. Uh, Saints, we'll be back on the line for prayer tomorrow night. 7 p.m. Looking forward to seeing you there. We've got two more nights of prayer, two, uh, Thursday and Friday. Please join us as we pray. Young people, young people, be on the line with us. You are there seeking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Give the Lord some time. 7 p.m. tomorrow. Get on the line with us. Pray with us. Get ready. Get yourself ready. Prepare yourself to receive this wonderful gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God's going to do it for you. We're believing God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight. We bless you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done in our midst on tonight. God, I pray that you stir the gifts, cause the gifts to be stirred in our lives. Oh, God, rebuke the spirit of fear. Find that enemy, my God, that would intimidate us from launching out into the deep. And oh, God, working in the gifts and the ministries and the anointings and the giftings that you've given us. In the name of Jesus, I bind that spirit of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. God, do it for your glory. We pray, God, for Sunday night. My God, that you would pour out your spirit. God, don't wait till Sunday night. But God, I pray Sunday morning, even as we come into the sanctuary, the presence of the Lord will be ready and present to heal. Oh, Father God, that your anointing would rest heavy upon us that day. God, that the power of God would move in a mighty way. God, we pray for life-changing experiences in the Holy Ghost. We give you praise. We give you glory. God, we're ready to receive. God, we're ready. Oh, God, to accept whatever you have for us in Jesus' name. Lord, lift the faith of your people. Strengthen your people. Cause your people to believe your word and to believe and know that what they have asked for, they shall receive. As we ask, we shall receive. You said, as we seek, we shall find. As we knock, it shall be open. And we believe you, Lord, and we thank you that it shall be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Men's prayer breakfast. Men's breakfast, 8, 30, 8 o'clock this Saturday morning. Uh, Deacon Donald Jones will be our guest speaker. Looking forward to seeing you there on Saturday at 8 a.m. Sunday night is in person. Sunday night's in person, yes. Parents, bring your young people, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're looking forward to it. Come and be blessed. All right, we're good?